Hi everyone, and welcome back to this training session dedicated to HDS process. This is now the part two of this training course. Now that we know the feedstock characteristics and the objective to reach, we shall now focus on the way to get there, the HDS process. But what does an HDS unit look like? Remember that in order to let the reaction take place, a simultaneous presence of reactive feed plus hydrogen is mandatory, but also catalyst, pressure and temperature. In the process, we begin by increasing the pressure of the feed with a pump. Then we inject the hydrogen whose pressure has been increased with a compressor. We call this stream the hydrogen makeup gas. Once the feed and the hydrogen have been mixed together, we raise the temperature in heat exchangers, then in a heater, before entering the reactor. In the reactor, the feed plus hydrogen mixture meets the catalyst. The typical operating conditions in the reactor are a pressure ranging from 25 to 90 bars. This pressure is selected according to the difficulty of the feed to be hydrotreated a temperature between 350 and 400 degrees. In this reactor, we are going to consume the equivalent of 0.3 to 1.5% weight of the fresh feed according to the characteristics of the feed to be hydrotreated. But then, what happens in the reactor? In the reactor, we want to desulfurize the feed. But, in fact, a multitude of reactions occurs simultaneously. Some of them are desired, others are only the final consequence of the operating conditions. But let's begin with the first one, the HDS reactions. We represent here the molecules of raw diesel by two dibazothiophanic molecules. The hydrogen attacks these molecules to extract the sulfur and to form H2S. In parallel, the aromatics are also going to react with the hydrogen. Molecules presenting several aromatic rings are the most reactive. They will be hydrogenated into monoaromatic. Always in parallel, olefins are going to be saturated as soon as they will be in contact with the hydrogen molecule. The molecules that contain nitrogen are also going to react with the hydrogen. The nitrogen combined with the hydrogen to produce a molecule of ammonia or NH3. Finally, the two last reactions which we can mention are cracking and coking. Cracking occurs because since the temperature in the reactor is rather high, we cannot avoid some thermal cracking. We produce then light hydrocarbons, typically C1 to C4, as well as a quantity of molecules whose distillation curve is similar to the one of a gasoline. We call that cut wild naphtha. The reaction of coking is also linked to temperature. As we've seen before, in the reactor, some aromatics are hydrogenated. But since these reactions are balanced, some aromatic dehydrogenation also takes place, meaning that some coke forms at the catalyst surface. It is necessary to note that all these reactions are exothermic. It means that as soon as these reactions happen, the temperature increases along the catalytic bed. If we look a little bit closer, we see that the reactions of desulfurization are limited by the kinetics, in other words, by the temperature. If the temperature increases, the desulfurization increases, and reversely. Same for the olefin saturation reactions and denitrogenation reactions. However, it's not the case for the aromatic saturation reactions. Indeed, these reactions are also limited by the kinetics, as long as the temperature is lower than 360 degrees. As soon as the temperature exceeds 370 degrees, it is the opposite which occurs. In other words, if we increase the temperature beyond 370 degrees, we are going to hydrogenate less and less aromatic. The total hydrogen consumption is the resultant of all the reactions taking place in the reactor at the operating conditions, namely pressure and temperature. 
directions of desulfurization are the ones that we aim first. Even if they obviously contribute to the total hydrogen consumption in the reactor, they will not be the reactions which will consume the most hydrogen. In fact, aromatic saturation reactions consume a lot of hydrogen, and since the aromatic content is much higher than the sulfur, they often contribute the most to the total hydrogen consumption. Let's continue with the next step once the feed has been desulfurized. After exiting the reactor, the effluent is cooled down by preheating the mixture of feed plus hydrogen. Then we inject some water. Indeed, in the reactor effluent, there is some H2S and ammonia. It turns out that these two molecules have a strong affinity, especially when decreasing the temperature to a certain value. Once this temperature has been reached, H2S and ammonia combine together to form solid NH4HS salt. This salt settles on the wall of heat exchangers and piping. We risk then the partial or total plugging of the piping and heat exchangers. To avoid reaching this extreme situation, we inject some water to dissolve H2S and ammonia. Finally, we separate the water, the hydrogenated product, and the excess of hydrogen. The hydrogen is partially purged and the excess is recycled by a compressor. A part of this recycled hydrogen is used as a gaseous quench to manage the exothermicity of the reactions. Let me remind you that all the reactions occurring in the reactor are exothermic. Another part of this hydrogen is recycled towards the mixture of feed plus hydrogen. It is to be mentioned that sometimes we use a Nyman scrubber in the reaction section to remove the H2S from the recycle gas. Let's speak one moment about the overall mass balance within the unit. For doing that, imagine a unit in which we consume about 1 ton per hour of hydrogen in the reactor for the reactions, and in which we intentionally decide to bring 2 tons per hour of hydrogen in a makeup gas. The overall hydrogen mass balance imposes that 1 ton per hour of hydrogen has to leave the reaction section. But where does this hydrogen go? In fact, there are two wells of hydrogen in the system, the purge and the solubility of the hydrogen in the hydrogen hydrocarbon in the cold hypersol separated drum. Indeed, the thermodynamics equilibrium in the separator drum says that inevitably a part of the hydrogen dissolves in the hydrogen hydrocarbon. The rest is then purged. We use this hydrogen balance to control the pressure within the unit. If the pressure in the reaction increases, it's because we put too much hydrogen in the system. We shall open this purge to bring back the pressure to normal set point. But in the case the pressure falls, it's because we consume too much hydrogen compared to the one we put in the system with the makeup gas. In this case, it will be necessary to close the purge, and if it's not enough, to put more hydrogen in the system. And what about H2S? Indeed, the H2S produced in the reactor must leave the reaction section. As well as for the hydrogen, H2S has got three wells. The purge, the dissolved H2S in the hydrogen hydrocarbon, and sometimes the amine scrubber in case there is one in the unit. In the scenario we are not equipped with an amine scrubber, we just have seen before that the H2S has to leave the reaction section, either by the purge or by dissolution at cold high pressure separated drum. If we decide to purge, we will obviously purge H2S, but also some hydrogen because the recycled gas contains a high amount of hydrogen. In a scenario in which a refinery would have a tight overall hydrogen mass balance, we prefer minimizing the amount of hydrogen routed to the unit. The extreme situation would consist in having no purge, meaning that makeup gas in the unit exactly corresponds to the hydrogen which is consumed in the reactor. But in this case, where does the H2S go? No choice at all, it has to live under dissolved form in the hydrotreated product. 
and de facto the H2S partial pressure is going to rise in the reaction section until it is high enough to dissolve the entire H2S produced in the hydrotreated hydrocarbon. In other words, the H2S is going to concentrate in the recycled gas until this value of partial pressure. This concept is not obvious to figure out. I invite you to rethink about it by watching this video again if you feel like you did it. Once we have understood the overall mass balance within the unit, which are the process variables on which the operator has an influence, and how to control the reactions? We will talk about all this in the next video. Thank you for watching. Bye bye.